So this isn't a lesson 14 today. This is no. This uh, is a this is a side deal. This is a, a side um, uh, separate issue for question and answer. I think you guys have turned in a few questions. I don't, how many questions are there? There's we had about 10. We only got about seven today. You probably okay. get through about two of them. All right, we'll pace it. <laughs> we'll pace it the best we can. I apologize. I've been kind of busy and haven't had a chance to look into them. So if you'll be a little grace, graceful with me, gracious, graceful or graceful, if you move around well, yes, and Gracie's here, which always helps. And the, uh, but if you'll be grace-filled toward answers, it may take a minute just because of uh, that. Yeah, I just haven't had a chance to look at them, but that's okay. We'll do them. Real quick though, we always start with the trivia question. So we'll make it an easy one. After the resurrection of Jesus, he went out to uh, the shore where the disciples were fishing and told them to change their manner of fishing and catch fish. How many did they catch? There is a specific exactly. number. Yeah, I can't, yeah. yeah, it's not just that they caught so many that the next tour, like was another story. Larry, but how many? This. Yes, he, he always he catches should, at least know this the many fish. To this. How many fish did they catch? You always know how many fish you catch. 5,000? <laughs> Oh, so, uh, that's I, a really good guess I because that is a number. However, that's incorrect. What? How many, how many fish did they catch? Did Jesus, Jesus tell them to, well, after his resurrection, he went out to meet them on the shore and he told them, cast your nets and catch fish. And they caught a certain number that's listed. I can't remember exactly. Was it 162? Oh, that's so close. I think we're going to give you credit for the 162. It's 153. Absolutely. Very good. John 21, afterward Jesus appeared again to his disciples by a sea of Tiberias. Uh, verse 7, the disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, it's the Lord, when they saw him on the shore. Jesus said, bring some of the fish, verse 10, that you had just caught. Simon Peter climbed aboard and dragged the net ashore. It was full of, of large fish, 153. But even with so many, the net was not torn. John 21, 11. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. None of the disciples dared ask him, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Jesus came, took the bread, gave it to them. He did the same with the fish. This is now the third time Jesus appeared after he was raised from the dead. So really an incredible uh, blessing there, obviously, in terms of the, um, the catch and the blessing to the disciples. And of course, the risen Lord who was physically there. Always there. The amazing thing. All right, so we have some questions that were submitted by the class. Go. First question. What is the significance of the ninth hour mentioned in Acts 3 1? All right, the significance of the ninth hour in Acts 3 1. So Acts 3 1 must be Peter and John going to the temple to pray, and they met a lame man. Is that correct? Let's look at it since we have a verse, Acts 3. Peter and John went to pray, a lame man they mailed the way. He held out his palm, asked for an alm. Just what Peter did say, silver and gold have a none. But such I have I give you in the name of Jesus Christ, rise up and walk. So this happened at the ninth hour, right? Yes, sir. One day, Peter and John were going up to the temple at the time of prayer. At three in the afternoon or the ninth hour, a man crippled from birth was being carried from the temple gate called Beautiful, where he's put every day to beg from those going to the temple courts. All right, so, excuse me, come on in. We just barely started. Um, the question was, what is the significance of the ninth hour? Yeah, what is okay. the significance? Or is there a significance? Is there a significance? I'm gonna say the, the only significance there, I think, is that this was a time of prayer at the temple. There were three times of prayer. There was 9 a.m., 3 p.m., so those were the third hour and the ninth hour of the day, and then sunset. And at the third hour and the ninth hour, or 9 a.m. and 3 p.m., there was actually a sacrifice made at the temple. And so if he went into the temple court when the sacrifice was made, that would be the peak time, I would believe, for the uh, crippled man to be able to make. Because, you know, you don't see panhandlers out at midnight when there's almost no traffic on the road, right? They tend to be out there to beg or ask for money during the peak hours of traffic. And I think this is just a peak hour of traffic at the temple. I don't think it has more meaning. Uh, you could say that Jesus, you know, gave up the spirit at the ninth hour on the cross, 
Is that what you're about to ask? And well, the person that asked the question is not in the class. So, oh, okay. But I think he was th thinking maybe there was some, because the ninth hour appeared, so other times. Yeah, I mean, Jesus was uh, actively on the cross, we believe, from the third hour to the ninth hour at the minimum, because that was the time the darkness was over the earth. And, right. Uh, sorry, at the ninth hour in the morning, the third hour of the day, 9 a.m., I should say, not the ninth hour. And so I think the, the main significance, though, was just this was important to Jews that it was at the third or ninth hour, and that's probably it. Yes? It was important to them because it was one of the commands from the Old Testament that they worship at that time? Or? Uh, good question. It actually was not a command. It was a, um, well, they were, let me rephrase that. They were commanded, and the question was, is it important because they were commanded to be there, or it just um, convenience. convenience. They were to give two sacrifices a day at, at three and nine. Now, they didn't necessarily have the commandment to be at the temple during those sacrifices, but everybody knew those sacrifices were happening then because of the commandment. So what I would say is Peter and John were not commanded to be there, uh, but I, it was a uh, mandatory sacrifice before the Lord for the, uh, the priests. And so at the very minimum, you might want to just say Peter and John went to the temple because they were good Jews now practicing Christianity. Um, and they were not there to offend people. They were there to provide opportunities to teach. So that's what I think would be it. Okay. Okay. What Next else? question is a two part. Okay. Are humans the only creation known to have free will? The follow up to that is how do we reconcile our having free will to God already knowing the outcome? Boy, a predestination question. <laughs> so Thank they, you for coming. We're done. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to try to answer that very fast. So let me recite <laughs> the question. The question is Are humans the only creation of God with free will? Free will. I think that's a fair enough, easy answer of yes, because I don't think that there's ever evidence that other dominion created by God, other life, has dominion over other life like man was given in the Garden of Eden when Adam went to name the animals and uh, God said, you know, you have dominion over everything. Um, and the free will to choose, uh, presumably I believe that the serpent in the garden was only there to tempt Adam and Eve and not to tempt, say, the tiger or the ostrich or whatever. I think that was all about just the free will Preacher, and I would suggest too that even angels, cherubim, seraphim, heavenly bodies, even the elders in heaven don't seem to appear to me to have free will. I think they they are important creations by God, but they're not free will creatures. So I think only the soul made in the image of God has free will. So then the second part of that is how to reconcile that with uh, having that free will to God already knowing the outcome. Okay. Uh, the result of. Let's look over at Ephesians uh, 1, 3. Ephesians 1, 3. Mm -hmm. So how to reconcile that with God knowing outcomes versus having free will. Praise be to the God of our Father, of Lord, uh, the, praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love, he predestined us to be adopted as his sons through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will to the praise of his glorious grace, which he has freely given us, to, uh, given us in the one he loves. In him, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace. They lavish on us with all wisdom and understanding. And he made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he pur purposed in Christ, to be put into effect when the time shall have reached their fulfillment, to bring all things in heaven and on earth together under one head, even Christ. So in that passage, there's all the way from creation of the soul to uh, salvation in Christ uh, being mentioned through those whatever verses, seven, eight, seven verses. And... So the term that we get hung up on, frankly, I think is the predestined. That he predestined us, verse uh, 5, he predestined us to be adopted as sons of Christ Jesus. I would suggest the more proper way to be uh, interpretive of this passage is to look at adoption as the key element. 
and that is that God created all, wants all souls to be his, and he has brought us in, no matter where we feel like we got lost along the way, he brings us in as adopted sons and daughters of his. And you know, if you ever have been like to an adoption ceremony, there's the comment is always made now, legally, that this person is in your family, this person is your family, this person has every right to the family as one biologically born into it. And I think the key there is that because we're all created in the image of God, we're all able to be saved through the blood of Christ and brought into the fold as adopted um, individuals. And really, I mean, it's, it's really biological individual and adopted individual. It's just presumably because we go astray in sin, we then get adopted back in. So I believe that the way to reconcile that with God knowing that, um, you know, whether we're saved or not, is we always have choice in that process. God always has omniscience in that process of knowing how things go without time. But we are bound by time, and we, as created individuals on the earth, we go birth to death and have all of our events in between. And <clears throat> But God has that all-knowing uh, awareness of his own creation. And I think he knows full well who will end up being saved, but I think he provides that opportunity to all to be saved. And so it's then up to us whether we, uh, once we're adopted into that heavenly family, whether we abide by that and thrive in it, or whether we reject it and say, oh, you know, this family isn't good enough, I'm going to go after this other one, and which is what people do in sin. Yes? Okay, you just stirred something up in my mind. Mm -hmm. Okay, you're saying that you presume that the angels do not have free will and all that. Okay, so right. then what caused Lucifer there you go. to uh, him his make his dominion? Okay, is <laughs> I'm that one of the questions? Advocate. No, no, I'll answer no. that. <laughs> um, you know, that's a that's a Sorry. tough answer. No, that's fine. The question was, given that um, we have free will as creative people, what was the situation with Lucifer and? Mm -hmm lack of free will. First of all, I want to say I think we don't understand the spiritual realm completely. Because I think it is very difficult for us to discern of a time, for instance, before we individually were alive, much less before the creation of the universe. And so, I think and this is a little wacky for some, but that's okay. But that, it's just my view. I think we have way overstated the idea of Lucifer uh, and being in the heavenly realm and then desiring to be out of the heavenly realm through his own free will, I suspect, and this is where it gets wacky, that there have been other creations than just earth for God's people. I think that God created earth. You know, if you go back to the beginning, you have the earth was formless and void and the spirit of God was moving over the surface of the water. Why would there be a formless and void planet or realm if God didn't have potentially some plan for it and is God too small to have more than one realm where he's created living creatures shall we say not necessarily humans but where he's created living creatures to deal with I wonder if the whole description about Satan falling and um, you know having pride and such is really more of a realm of a prior um, creation of God that did have some degree of free will and then now in our realm there isn't free will for any but humans and so the second thought I'd have on that is when we look at Lucifer and I think it's Isaiah 14 uh, Lucifer itself means morning star and was was transliterated to Lucifer from Greek and the term Lucifer only appears there in the Bible and may very well actually be associated with the with um, salvation and the morning star being like this is how we find our way with the morning star and not with Satan. Let's look at that real quick uh, because I think that has been one that's been over translated. Yeah, maybe misunderstood is a fair term, maybe over translated. Um, and I think that uh, if we look at the um, the morning star as opposed to let's see, that is Isaiah 14 
Um, and I'll go to verse, uh, let's actually start at verse 1, and I'll read a few in there. Isaiah 14, 1, the Lord will have compassion on Jacob. Once again, he will choose Israel and will settle them in their own land. Okay, let's think about that for a second. Okay, that's the same thing that God says to almost every prophet, almost every time, is uh, Israel will fall, Israel will be restored when they turn to me. Okay, then let's go to verse 3. On the day the Lord gives you relief from suffering and turmoil and cruel bondage, you'll take up this taunt against the king of Babylon. Who's he speaking to? How the oppressors come to an end as Gary's ended. Well, he's, he's signed to the king of Babylon who had the Israelites in captivity and was, um, he was saying that once the Israelites are taken from captivity, you can taunt the king because he will have lost his hold on you. Uh, let's go down to verse 9. The grave below is all stirred to meet you at your coming, so the king of Babylon is going to die. And, uh, you know, as all people do. Um, verse 10, they all respond. They'll say, you also become weak as we are. You become like us. He's only a human. Verse 11, with all, all your pomp has been brought down to the grave, along with the noise of your harps. Maggots are spread out underneath you, beneath you, and worms cover you. Got to tell you, your body is going to decay at some point. Hate to be the one to bring that to you. But it is true. All people will suffer death. How long, how you have fallen, verse 12, from heaven, O morning star, son of the dawn. Some of you that may say, how you fall fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, which means, O morning star, uh, son of the dawn. You have been cast down to the earth, you who were, you who once laid low the nations. You said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven. I will raise my throne above the stars of God. I will sit enthroned on the mount of assembly. And the utmost heights of the sacred mountain, I will ascend above the tops of the clouds. I'll make myself like the most high. But you're brought down to the grave, to the depths of the pit. Those who see you stare at you. They ponder your fate. Is this the man who shook the earth and made kingdoms tremble? The man who made the world a desert, who overthrew its cities and would not let his captives go home. So he's talking about the king of Babylon who wouldn't let the captives go home and how the king of Babylon would die like all other people. We have taken that to say, oh, you, you know, Lucifer, Morning Star, you have wanted to be like God, and you've fallen to the earth, and you're in the pit, the abyss, which is also translated Sheol and uh, hell. And I can see where that comes from. But I think trying to take this small passage of prophetic scripture about the king of Babylon and extrapolate it to um, the way... Uh, things happen before the earth was created spiritually speaking is very difficult I just don't I don't really see that so the other main passage that I think is uh, in need of mention would be over at Revelation 12 let's turn there uh, Revelation 12 a great wonder sign appeared in heaven a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet and crowned in 12 stars on her head she was pregnant and cried out in pain and was about to give birth. Then another sign appeared in heaven, an enormous red dragon with seven heads, ten horns, seven crowns on his heads. His tail swept a third of the stars out of the sky and flung them to the earth. The dragon stood in front of the woman who was about to give birth so he might devour her child the moment it was born. She gave birth to the son, a male child, who will rule all the nations with an iron scepter. And her child was snatched up to God in his throne. The woman fled into the desert to a place prepared for her uh, by God, where she might be taken care of for 1,260 days. And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon. The dragon and all his angels fought back, but he was not strong enough, and they lost their place in heaven. The great dragon was hurled down, the ancient serpent called the devil, or Satan, who leads the whole world astray. He was hurled to the earth and his angels with him. Now, when I look at this, I'll read a little more in a minute. I can see that sounds much more like what I would picture as a spiritual battle that wasn't necessarily that it was, oh, I want to think of a way to say this, it won't be alarming. Um, everybody, I, I don't think of it in the way that we often teach, which is Satan said, hey, I'm going, I'm going to get together a third of the angels and two thirds of the angels are going to say to God, we're going to have a war. Let's see who wins. That's the way it's often taken by people who want to translate this into, oh, I know exactly what happened in the spiritual realm. 
What I think happened in the spiritual realm was that in order for God to be the ultimate good, there also is evil. And God cannot represent the evil. And I think Satan has existed as the deceiver, the destroyer, the combative one, the one who causes doubts and causes judgment to be brought upon oneself, even when God says you can live in blessing and all those things. I think that's just the spiritual nature of good and and evil and God is better than any evil and I don't necessarily think this was Satan going in and saying oh you know I want a third of the angels come with me and we're going to rebel and we're going to fall and we're going to be trouble now I know there are passages that mention uh, issues of fallen angel um, you know and, and various passages like that I would also suggest that when you look at evil in the Bible that the term the deceiver is translated into the name Satan. It is, it's not definitive that Satan is the great deceiver, if that makes sense to you. Now, the one passage I'd throw out there that I think pertains to that, and then we'll plan and move and to the I've next heard question. It says adversary. adversary, yeah. Yes. Deceiver, adversary, destroyer, you know. And so what it is, and this is this goes to the passage in John 17 where God, where Jesus said, I'm you know, don't worry when I leave because I'm sending one after me, the counselor, to uh, give you everything you need to survive, to remember my words and to um, go on existing as the person you are on earth, even though I will be the taken up. Uh, onto the cross, killed, put in the grave, and raised from death. They didn't understand all that, but he said, I'm going to send to you the counselor. The counselor is the opposite of the deceiver, destroyer, accuser, uh, if you view it like a courtroom situation, where you have you have the or excuse me, prosecutor, and you have the defender, and what he's really talking about there is kind of like being split like sheep and goats to the right and left on the judgment day is that you will have one who will come to accuse you you'll have one who's here to defend you your counselor your your attorney your lawyer your supporter your advocate and that in the balance there god ultimately will decide who is uh in you know saved by the blood of christ and who's not i think it's it's that type of description that we see in scripture that we have maybe because we need a simplistic way to think about it we have sort of perceived of you know satan is running around trying to get people which i i'm not at all saying that there is an evil influence trying to take away from our righteous uh lives but there also is the counselor the holy spirit and god himself and jesus on earth and god everywhere who's there trying to hold us in the fold and keep us there too. And I think we've misunderstood that a little bit. Let me read now John 1, 6. One day the angels came to present themselves before the Lord and Satan came also with them. The Lord said, Satan, where have you come from? Satan answered from roaming through, through the earth, going back and forth then. Then the Lord said to Satan, have you considered my serpent, serpent <laughs> that's a misreading, <laughs> my servant Job, uh, there's no one on earth like him. He's blameless and upright, a man who fears God and shuns evil. Does Job fear God for nothing? Satan replied. Have you not put a hedge around him and his household and everything he has? You bless the work of his hands, his flocks, his herds, spread throughout the land, but stretch out your hand, strike everything he has, and he will surely curse you to your face. The Lord said to Satan, Very well then, everything he has is in your hands, but on the man himself do not lay a finger. So Satan came with the angels. That's the one way people think of Satan as a fallen angel, of course. But I would also suggest that this is, I think, a realm that is spiritual that we don't understand. We don't understand what it is for God to be in a spot, bring in angels, bring in Satan, discuss individuals, and none of this would have happened without God allowing it. It wasn't that Satan was an independent agent. It was God said, okay, you can strike him and see what happens and that was all by the allowance of god okay yes. lastly would you uh -huh. say that of course god creates everything right yes that this he created um lucifer sort of the same vein as he had a purpose right and so did judas iscariot mm -hmm. i would agree 
And the question was, would we view like Lucifer or Satan, if you want to use those interchangeably, like uh, Judas Iscariot or like Pharaoh, mm -hmm. or like any of the number of individuals in the Bible that at one point or another had said that their hearts were hardened mm -hmm. and the purpose of God could come about. I believe, uh, and this is another one that's a little bit vague, I guess, uh, in a sense, but by my faith approach to scripture is that I think God works out everything for us in every way imaginable. And I think that there are times where we yield to other temptation, other influences, have the accuser come to us to try to pull us away. Uh, that can be referred to as devil, Satan, the accuser, the evil, uh, whatever you want to call that um, individual. Um, but ultimately God's bigger and more in charge and more capable and you know, allows us to be saved in any circumstance. And I think we as humans fail to see that because when we fall away from the grace of God, when we sin, and sin is defined as separation from God, when we sin, we tend to think, oh, I've done it, I'm done, I can't come back, God won't forgive me. All that is deceptive teaching of evil. And I think the reality is, no matter what that sin is, we can come back from it. And of course, somebody's going to ask about the unforgivable sin. I will just mention that I believe that is that you deny the existence of God. If you deny the existence of God, if you blaspheme against him, you will not seek him. And so that's on you. That's not on God saying, I can't forgive that. It's that you don't go to God for forgiveness. But I think in all that, though, if we view, you know, I think that Judas was in a rough spot as a person. I think that uh, Pharaoh was in a rough spot as a person. And I suspect God has a graceful approach to that that we don't even understand. Because they were using his will. The way his will worked out was ultimately, for instance, Judas uh, repented through the coins back. And, you know, um, I think we went through that recently in more depth, too. But I think that... Um, it's just important for us to realize that if God says, I, I have sent my own son for you to die, his blood is sufficient for all, for all forgiveness. I think it's, it's our faith response to believe that. And I think we should. I think God means it when he wants companionship. And the reason I think that he created Adam in the first place was to have companionship with him in the garden. I think there is something different about a free will creature wanting to be in relationship with you as opposed to, you know, a, a hedgehog that you create and can look at. I think it's it's very different when someone wants to be in a loving relationship with you. Okay, what's the next? The we next question the next was question. submitted twice. So okay. this is a very popular question. It's a real question. It's a real <laughs> question, yeah. So we have a backup. Genesis 6, 4 mentions the Nephilim, or Nephilim, who were giants. Mm -hmm. that were heroes and old warriors. What are your thoughts and explanation of these creatures and their role in the early days well, of the earth? That plays into the angel question, too. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Turn to Genesis 6. See, so the question, just to restate it, was what are the Nephil Nephilim or Nephilim, if you want to call them or Nephil. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but I'll call them Nephilim. The, uh, what were they? So let's read real quick Genesis 6, 1. When man began to increase in number on the earth and daughters were born to them, the sons of God saw that the daughters of men were beautiful and they married any of them they chose. Then the Lord said, My spirit will not contend with man forever, for he is mortal. His days be 120 years. The Nephilim were on the earth in those days and also afterward. When the sons of God went to the daughters of men and had children by them, they were the heroes of old, men of renown. The Lord saw how great man's wickedness had become on the earth, and after and that every inclination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil all the time. The Lord was grieved that he made man on the earth, and his heart was filled with pain. The Lord said, I will wipe mankind whom I created from the face of the earth, men and women, uh, well, men and animals, women too, and creatures that move along the ground, the birds of the air, for I am grieved that I have made them. But Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. So, I think there are three things at play here as opinions. Uh, I will reference our own lesson way back uh, two years ago that's online if you want. It's available through the church website on spiritual warfare because I think we went into it for an hour. Um, 
But there are three lines of thought. One is that the sons of God and the daughters of men were that the sons of God were angels and the daughters of men were people uh, and that the angels came and married the uh, children of people, uh, the daughters of people, and made a super uh, race, the Nephilim, who were considered to be giants, both physically and maybe uh, strength-wise, possibly emotionally, possibly spiritually. I, the second opinion, then I'll shoot down each in order. Um, the second opinion, or I'll support them if that's appropriate. The, the second thought is that the sons of God were the children of Shem, and that the daughters of men were the daughters of the Canaanite line. And so in the realm of, uh, not Shem, I'm sorry, um, Seth, I misspoke. Seth, the child of Adam and Eve. And so the children of Seth versus the uh, children of Cain, uh, because Cain had killed Abel, of course, that they Cain was driven away from the rest of the people, and he went and built cities and had you know his mark on his head because he was afraid somebody would kill him for turning against God for having killed Abel. And he said, you know, where can I go that because somebody would kill me? And God said, I'm putting a mark on you. If anyone touches you, you know they're in for it too, so they won't touch you. And so he built cities. So. Of course, the mystery there is where did all the people come from? There apparently were a lot of people around in order to build cities. Very few people in old times or new tend to build cities with no people around. So <laughs> I think it, um, I think it's very possible that the sons of God being the Sethites, if you will, marrying the daughters of men or the Canaanites was an air mixing that God did not allow at that time in history. There clearly seemed to be a separation of you and your clan go this way this clan will say this way and you will be separate. So I think that's possible. Um, I think it's also really hard to say that it's the sons of uh, God and the daughters of men because I'm sure it would go both ways too. I, I mean, I think that's just an odd phraseology. The third thought that I don't give a lot of credence to is that this was the patriarchal age. This was the time of you know, Noah, of course, being the head of his family. There was no Mosaic law. There was no Christian law. There was no blood of Christ. There was no sacrifice at the temple under the Mosaic law. This was the era of patriarchs. And if you look at this term where it says, they, verse 4, they were heroes of old, men of renown, uh, that these were the patriarchs and the patriarchs of their own little kingdoms, like, for instance, that of Melchizedek, for instance, that Moses, or that, uh, excuse me, Abraham encountered. Uh, that they had their own kind of fiefdom and that they were taking any women they wanted and marrying them into their clan and that that was also seen as sinful by God. So of those, I think the most plausible is that of the, uh, this saying that these were sons of God being angels, came down to marry the daughters of men and interfere with God's creation. The problem with that and the reason I'm going to say I don't believe that is that this is uh, some degree of misunderstanding of language. And look at it with me carefully again. At uh, Genesis 6, 1, the men began to increase in number on the earth, and daughters were born to them. The sons of God saw that the daughters of men were beautiful. They married any of them they chose. Okay, that all sounds like, you know, it could be Sethites marrying the outside the clan like they were presumably not expected to be able to, or shouldn't do. Then the Lord said, My spirit will not contend with man forever, for he is mortal. His days will be 120 years. So does that have any comment that would make you think there's an angel involved? Not really. You know, if you really think about that, when it says the sons of God, it doesn't say angels. And we already had some influence of cherubim at the Garden of Eden, for instance, blocking the way. You know, it wasn't like angels didn't exist. And... So I have a little trouble seeing the sons of God being angels. Plus, I don't believe the angels can procreate. You know, there's creation where God makes something from nothing. And then there's procreation where God makes something else from something he created. Like, for instance, men and women, when they marry and they um, mix the sperm and egg and have a child, that is procreation. And so there's no evidence that angels either increase in number with time or have the opportunity or the ability or the physical 
situation to be able to procreate nor to create. We cannot create, but we can procreate the way God made us and our bodies, and that's true of most all of God's creation. Nearly everything in the earth creation procreates. You know, you form a seed of an acorn and it falls in the ground and it grows at an oak tree. It doesn't, you know, fail to grow one after its own kind. It doesn't, you know, produce a human over there. It procreates from what was uh, what it was initially. So if you look at verses 1 through 3, I don't necessarily see mentioning of anything, including the Lord said, my spirit will not contend with man forever for he's mortal. Why would God have angels procreating with humans and say, I'm not going to contend with man? Why not say, I'm not going to contend with these angels in the spiritual situation? So, that's part of my answer. Second is, the Nephilim were on the earth in those days. Does that sound like that's sort of a side thought too? Does it say the Nephilim were the sons of God who came and married the daughters of man? No. No, it says the Nephilim were on the earth in those days and also afterward. Oh boy, that blows, blows away the idea of well, let's get rid of the, um, let's you know wipe out the earth so that there's no longer an angel coming down to try and marry a human, right? Because it says and also afterward when the sons of God went to the daughters of men and had children by them. They were heroes of old, men of renown. So it says there the Nephilim were men, right? Doesn't say Nephilim were the angels of renown. So I see a little challenge there. Now, the other thing that I think enters into play is that the word Nephilim means fallen. If you translate from Hebrew, it means fallen. So if you think about it, you could say these were people who should be powerful in God's presence but had fallen away from the will of God. Let's look real quickly over at Numbers 13, I think it is. Numbers 13, yeah, they, uh, the spies go to Canaan and blow it. They, uh, Numbers 13, 26, they came back to Moses there and the Holy Israelite community in Kadesh in the desert. They reported to them the whole assembly and showed them the fruit of the land. They gave Moses this account. We went into the land the, to which you sent us and it does flow with milk and honey. Here's the fruit. But the people who live there are powerful. The cities are fortified and very large. We even saw descendants of Anak there. The Amalekites live in the Negev, the Hittites, Jebusites, the Amorites live in the hill country, and the Canaanites live near the sea and along the Jordan. So I do agree that the spies went in and looked around a lot. They knew who was there. But of course, 10 were uh, in fear and two were um, strong. And that was Caleb and Joshua who were the only two who were allowed to live long enough to enter the land of Canaan. So then, verse 30, then Canaan, uh, Caleb silenced the people before Moses and said, We should go up and take possession of the land, for we can certainly do it. But the men who had gone up with them said, We can't attack those people. They're stronger than we are. And they spread among the Israelites a bad report about the land they had explored. They said, The land we explored devours those living in it. All the people we saw there are of great size. We saw the Nephilim there, the descendants of Anak, come from the Nephilim, we seem like grasshoppers in our own eyes, and we looked the same to them. So let's think about this for a minute. Uh, when they were spreading rumors among the Israelites, what happens with rumors? We all know from the gossip game that it gets extrapolated into fear, right? And into an over-response of what was seen. Do you think they went in and literally saw the earth devouring people who were trying to live in it? Probably not. I mean, I guess there could have been an earthquake and a crevice opened up and devoured some people. I don't really think that was their point. I think their point was to say, we are in extreme fear of these people because we don't feel strong enough to defeat them. Even though God said we can defeat them, they've got cities. We have tents. You know, this was a big deal of we're in fear of these people. So they extrapolated this, it sounds like to me, into the descendants of Anak who were big, powerful warriors. They weren't necessarily giants. They were powerful warriors. And they were like uh, Nephilim. They were, um, you know, we were like grasshoppers in their eyes. I think that's figurative, honestly. Mm -hmm. I don't think that there were nine foot nine people other than the rare 
the actual descendants of Anak who were like Goliath and his brothers. And it's of interest that if you really look at the translation about Goliath, and we say he was six cubits and a span because it says that, that that also can be translated just as easily as six feet and a span, which would be six foot six, not nine foot nine. And so, you know, that some of that has been a little bit over um, extrapolated in my mind to uh, trying to prove the existence of, of um, giants. And I feel like if you look at history, there is not particularly any evidence that people have ever been over somewhere, you know, around the peak that we see now of somewhere around seven feet. Now I know there, you know, Oban seven four is he seven thirty five? I don't know. What um, is the same tribe in Africa? Yeah, so there are a few tribes, and there are a few Sudanese that are tall, but they're not nine feet nine, and they're not giants as we would tend to think of giants, like, you know, like. Big, as tall or taller than this room coming in. And there aren't structures that have been found archeologically that support the idea that there are entire races or groups of people who are 10 feet tall. And I think if you look at the verses that talk about the Nephilim, you can see, let's look at one more. I'm looking real quick here. Ezekiel, oh, we're all sound. Um, Ezekiel 32, 26. This is a, uh, you know, I know we all get scared when we open Ezekiel. Don't be too scared because there are, there are some good things in there that if you understand what he's talking about, really helps. But he was talking about a lament for Pharaoh. In fact, I'll go back to um, verse 1, 32, 1. In the twelfth year and twelfth month, the first day, the word of the Lord came to me, Ezekiel, son of man. Take up a lament concerning Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Say this to him. So he's talking about Pharaoh and to Pharaoh. And then he gets down to verse 26. Meshach and Tubal are there. They, with all their hordes around their graves, all of them are uncircumcised, killed by the sword because they spread their terror in the land of the living. They do not lie with other uncircumcised warriors who have fallen, who went down to the grave with their weapons of war whose swords, or do they not, excuse me, do they not lie with other uncircumcised warriors who fallen, who went down to the grave with their weapons war, whose swords were placed under their heads. So stop there for a second. The uncircumcised were the non-Israelites, so this would be any warrior under the world of warriors that were not Israelite warriors, okay? So those were the uncircumcised. Then, down to where I stopped there, the punishment for their sins rested on those bones, um, Though the terror of these warriors had stalked through the land of the living, you too, O Pharaoh, will be broken and will lie among the uncircumcised with those killed by the sword. So that sounds an awful lot like how he was talking about the king of Babylon would eventually die just like all people do because he is not God. He just kind of thinks he is. Edom is there. Her kings and all her princes, despite their power, they are laid with those killed by the sword. They lie with the uncircumcised with those who go down to the pit. All the princes of the north and all the Sidonians are there. They went down with the slain in disgrace, despite the terror killed by their power. They lie uncircumcised with those by the, uh, killed by the sword and bear the shame with those who go down to the pit. Pharaoh, he and his army, will see them, and he'll be consoled for all his hordes that were killed by the sword, declares the Lord God. Although I have, I had him spread terror on the land of the living, Pharaoh and all his hordes, will be laid among the uncircumcised and those killed by the sword, declares the sovereign Lord. So that entire passage is about being fallen before God. And the word that is woven through this is the word Nephilim for fallen. And so here he's not talking about giants and he's not talking about part angel, half angel. He's not talking about huge monster beasts. He's talking about those who are fallen before the Lord because the Lord is greater than them. And I think that's a, uh, of interest too in looking at the passage of Genesis 6. So I guess, I don't know, I hope that answered your question, but I'll tell you my final translation myself, for, for myself of Genesis 6 is that the people of the earth started to commit sin one with another without regard for God's plan 
for marriage, for uh, relationship with one's own people, which was a big deal in the Old Testament. I will say I don't think that there are racial boundaries in the modern world. I think that um, God used to have his chosen race of the Israelites and all others, and now we're told that as Gentiles were just as welcome in the kingdom as Jews, and I think that was a different era. But I think that people on the earth committed sin by having relationships with people all over the place without the regard for God's will. And that there also were many powerful people in the world who failed to acknowledge God's power. That there, even the leaders, even the, if you want to call them patriarchs or the Nephilim being the big powerful people there, even they were in disregard to God's will. So God said, you know, I'm grieved that I made people. There's only sin everywhere. I'm going to wipe them out. But he found the one righteous man, Noah. And that's how I see it interpretively. Uh, you're welcome to feel like there are angels involved there if you wish. I don't think that's a heaven or hell issue for us, a doctrine issue. But I, that's how I feel about it. So I guess we're out of time. Uh, yeah, how many questions three. did we answer? We got three. We got three. Uh, All right. It's like, it's like a miracle. Uh, so anyway, thanks for bearing with me. And I'll, um, I'll see if I can read over some questions before next week maybe and see what we could do to answer the rest. So let's see if we can answer the other, how many? Uh, there's seven total. Seven total, the other four next week. And then uh, then we'll go on into some Christian ethics. I think it's important that we study some ethical issues going into the fall elections. Uh, I think we need to also ethically consider whether we are people of God or people of, of the United States and how that is separate. I think that's important too. So we're going to say a lot of Christian ethics starting in two weeks. Thank you for all the attention today. Good job. All right. Thank you. Absolutely. Not stopping.